test has three parts, and in each part, you hear a number of different extracts. At the beginning of the test, you will hear a beep sound. You have time to read the questions before you hear the extracts. You will hear each extract only once. You have to complete your answers as you listen. At the end of each test, you will be given two minutes to check answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with information you hear. Extract 1. Questions 1 to 12. You hear an emergency doctor talking to a patient called Penny Rawford. For questions 1 to 12, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. Mrs. Rawford? So, I understand you've been brought in here because you fainted at work. That's right. Can you tell me a bit about it? Well, I can't really remember much. I was sitting at my desk and I suddenly got this really awful headache. My head felt like someone had fired a bullet into it. I've never had anything like it. I mean, I've had headaches before, but nothing serious. And this one was different because it was just in one place in my forehead here. And I can't remember what happened then, but my colleague sitting at the next desk, she saw me and she says I collapsed onto my desk. So she came over to help, but she says she couldn't wake me up and I was out for quite a few minutes. But I wasn't still. She says I was jerking, but I can't remember any of it. Apparently they called an ambulance and I do remember the paramedics arriving and I was able to answer some of their questions. Even though I was still feeling a bit groggy, they asked me if I'd had any sort of trauma before I fainted, but I hadn't. I'd woken up as normal and cycled into work. Nothing unusual. Oh, and they also wanted to know if I had taken any recreational drugs, but I wouldn't ever touch anything like that. I don't even drink alcohol. But they did ask me if I'd had any incontinence when I was unconscious, and I found that I'd leaked a bit of urine. I was ever so embarrassed, but they were quite okay about it. I suppose they're used to it. And once they'd got me into the ambulance, I felt really awful. I had this nausea, but they gave me something for it. It's not so bad now. Oh, that's good. So, how's your health been generally in the past? Have you ever had anything like this before? No, not really. I did go to the doctor a few years ago when I had some stomach pains. They did an endoscopy, but everything was normal and I've been fine since then. I'm usually quite healthy, all my family are. I've only ever had one operation and that was a few years back now, in 2014. It was just after I'd had my third child, I had to have a hysterectomy. But I've been fine since then. Oh, um, there was something about a year later. It must have been 2015. I'd been putting on a bit of weight and I thought it was because of the operation. But I'd been feeling a bit tired as well and getting these cramps at night. The doctors did some tests because they thought I might have an underactive thyroid, but it was okay. I think maybe I'd just been overdoing it a bit. Oh, that's excellent. Well, how do you feel now? It looks as if you've got a bit of bruising there on your face. Yes, and I think I've got a cut there too, a little one under my eye. That must be where I fell on my desk. I've still got a bit of a headache, but nothing like as bad as it was. I do feel as if my neck's a little stiff, but that might be because I've been lying down. And the paramedics asked me lots of questions to see if I had anything funny with my vision, but that's all okay. Great. So now I'd like... Now look at the notes for Extract 2. Extract 2, questions 13 to 24. 
you hear part of a consultation between a neurologist and a patient called Peter Jackson. For questions 13 to 24, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. Morning, Mr. Jackson. Now, you've been referred to me by your GP, and I'm the first neurologist you've seen, I think. That's right. I think my GP's got some ideas about what my problem may be, but he sent me here, you know, to double check. Okay. I've got some notes here with his referral letter, but it'd be helpful if you could tell me in your own words the symptoms you first noticed. Well, there were several things which started early last year. They don't sound too bad individually, but together they were affecting me quite a bit. I guess the worst thing was, well, feeling absolutely shattered, you know, feeling exhausted most of the time, even when I'd not been doing much. I'd never suffered from depression, but I started feeling a bit down. There wasn't a specific trigger. And any physical pain then? Well, my right leg, it didn't ache exactly, but there was a real stiffness which made walking slower. And my neck was affected too. Again, not a pain, but more like a tightness. Yeah, that's how it felt. And it still does. Um, I started to get constipated too, and I'd never had a problem with that before. I see. And I noticed other things around the same time, like my handwriting. I used to write strong, big letters, everyone always said how distinctive it was. But it was shrinking. Weird how it had changed. I'm right-handed and I began to notice from time to time there was like, well, a spasm in that hand. It didn't happen often, but it was worrying. The worst thing though was something I noticed when I was in its standing position. You know, washing up or shaving. I'd suddenly feel really unstable on my feet. That must have been frightening. Yeah, I was always scared of toppling backwards. And I gather you've recently started to experience other symptoms? Yeah, this last month or so. It's funny, I used to love cooking, testing out different ingredients and stuff, but my sense of smell's just gone. I don't like preparing meals nearly as much. Then, something which drives me mad is that I keep forgetting things. I used to have such a good memory, and the really frustrating thing, especially for someone who was never exactly quiet is, that people keep on asking me to speak louder, but I just can't seem to raise the volume now. My mouth feels full of saliva too. It, it, it seems to build up more, so I'm wondering if that's got anything to do with it. Any physical activities you're finding hard? Oh yeah, driving's hard, so I don't use the car anymore. I can still use keys to lock doors, though sometimes it's tricky, but buttoning up cardigans and shirts is impossible now. It's so fiddly. I'm getting an electric toothbrush too, cause the manual one's so difficult. I'm ashamed to admit my wife insists on cutting up my food too, when she sees me struggling, especially when things like, er, steak. And you went on to consult other GPs? Yeah, I saw two doctors in the same practice for a second opinion. The first mistakenly thought it was a trapped nerve and the next sent me for a facial, saying it was probably a frozen shoulder. That was wrong. So he then thought it might be carp, carpal tunnel syndrome, affecting my wrist. They were just investigating possible causes. Yeah, fair enough. And I'm hoping it's nothing serious. I mean, I don't think it's a brain tumor or anything. But I have started to worry that it might be multiple sclerosis. You know, given the symptoms, then my granddad had dementia. I desperately hope it's not that. I don't think so. And uh, looking at the tests you've had, a blood test and... A thyroid functional test. But I never heard anything back from that, so I'm assuming it was negative. Okay, well, I'm going to look at your notes again.
That is the end of part A. Now turn over and look at part B. Part B, questions 25 to 30. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Now look at question 25. You hear a nurse reporting to a medical team about a patient. Now read the question. We have one geriatric patient, Mr. Drake, in room 242. He's had two strokes in the past, and there's some cognitive impairment. The reason he was admitted from his nursing home yesterday was essentially that he's been refusing food for three days. But there are definitely signs of depression. Last night, the duty nurse reported that he was saying, I want to die, I want to die, though he didn't say this to me personally. Apparently, his wife's in another nursing home. They have no contact and she's not been able to visit him. So we're going to try to figure out how to get them together because that'll give him something to look forward to. In the meantime, the plan is to get him up. We'll start with the cardiac chair until physiotherapy can see him. Question 26. You hear a hospital nurse talking to a patient about oxygen therapy. Now read the question. Mr. Anand, here's the oxygen mask, which we agreed would be a good idea while you're having breathing problems. Oh, thanks. Now, it's really easy to operate. Have you used one before? Uh, yeah. At home last year for a fortnight. I think I remember what to do. Good. So, you're aware of the effect on your mouth? I'll keep drinking a little and often, because otherwise the oxygen can dry it out, can't it? That's right. You've got to keep hydrated, so do shout out if your water jug needs refilling. Do you have any other concerns? Well, last time the skin here, behind my ears, got quite painful and raw because of the elastic straps tight against it. Well, if you use these little pads and loosen the straps, it'll stop that happening. Great! Question 27. You hear a surgeon briefing her team about a patient they will operate on later in the day. Now read the question. And the next on today's list is Freddy, who's a cloacal extrophy with a cross-fused ectopic kidney. He has a history of respiratory infections too, and there's a high risk of him getting another one following the procedure, so he'll need to be in the intensive care unit. We obviously can't start until we hear there's a place for him there, but they're calling us shortly and they sounded pretty positive this morning. This is today's main case and I'd like to get started around midday so we can spend the whole afternoon focused on this. Question 28. You hear two hospital nurses talking about a patient's medication. Now read the question. Now, Mrs. Thompson here needs IV administration of her antibiotics. 
Okay. I was a bit worried about her swallowing reflex, actually. She's hardly touched her food since she came in. But she's been assessed by the therapist, who said there wasn't a problem. She's been unable to keep anything down since yesterday morning anyhow, so there's no point trying to give her the tablets. I see her operation set for Friday morning, so she won't be able to eat in any case in another 72 hours. But that still gives us a window for the antibiotics. We'd still better use IV to be on the safe side. No problem. I'll set up the drip straight away. Question 29. You hear a pharmacist talking to a customer about head lice in children. Now read the question. Hello. Can I help you? Yes. There's nits going around my son's school. I need something that'll stop him getting them, because they spread like wildfire, don't they? Has he got any symptoms? Has he been itchy or had a rash? I'm not saying he's got nits. It's more that I want to make sure he doesn't get them. I understand that, but unless your son's been confirmed as having head lice, it isn't advisable to use medication. Uh, I was told there was a lotion you could buy over the counter. I mean, if the nits jump from one kid's hair to another, it's only a matter of time. What's the point in waiting? Well, first of all, they don't jump. Um, to get head lice, your son needs to be in very close contact with another child who has them. Even then, it's by no means a foregone conclusion. Also, if they're detected early enough, you might get rid of them by combing alone. If that didn't work, well, then we'd recommend a lotion. Question 30. You hear an ophthalmic consultant giving feedback to a trainee who has just carried out an eye examination. Now read the question. So, were you happy with the examination? I think it was okay overall, but it was hard carrying out the procedures while having to deal with the patient's questions at the same time. Yes, that can be hard, but there were lots of good things. Reassuring the patient when necessary certainly helped the process. The patient seemed rather confused sometimes about what you wanted him to do, though. That's something to work on. Think about effective ways of communicating what's required. You described in full the reasons for the various procedures. And adapting your language style to this particular patient did seem to relax him. That sort of approach puts patients at ease. Right. Thanks. This is the end of Part B. Now look at Part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about specific aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer, A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now. Look at extract one. Questions 31 to 36. You hear an ear, nose and throat specialist called Cynthia Davison giving a presentation about the causes and treatment of nosebleeds. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36.
Good afternoon, I'm Cynthia Davison, and my presentation will focus on the causes and treatments of nosebleeds and the implications for those of us working in the health service. About 60% of people get nosebleeds at some time in their life, particularly children and old people. Most of these events resolve spontaneously, and the mortality rate from nosebleeds is extremely low. But treating them still costs the health service a lot of money. In my own hospital, over 40% of admissions in ENT involve nosebleeds. Ideally, we treat many of these as outpatients, yet the majority of those patients will stay in for five days. Last year, in my department, a quarter of a million euros was spent on the management of this condition. Clearly, any saving on that if duplicated in hospitals across the country, would have a positive impact on resources for other services. The biggest enemy of the nosebleed is artificial air. In hospitals, we get an awful lot of older people coming in with nosebleeds in winter months. As you'll know, such patients don't tolerate the cold for various reasons, so they tend to sit besides radiators and heaters, and these dry up the air. This means the cilia, which protect the lining of the nose, dry out, and this in turn exposes the blood vessels, which causes bleeding. Our noses haven't developed a defense mechanism against artificial air. 300 years ago, everybody lived in drafty houses and cold environments. Now we all sit in heated rooms, and the nose hasn't adapted to this. The evolution of an organ can take millions of years, in fact. The immediate cause of a nosebleed can be local trauma or inflammation caused by a simple cold, but systemic diseases have to be ruled out in all adults presenting with the condition. People with chronic allergies in the nose are more prone to nosebleeds, and there are some other serious conditions that can present in this way, including cases where the kidney or the liver is no longer functioning as it should. Foreign bodies that enter the nose by some means can trigger nosebleeds, though these are more common in children than adults, and usually there'd be a foul discharge associated with the foreign body. But for a lot of the nosebleeds we see, about 30%, we can't find a specific cause. A lot of people who are at the age where they get high blood pressure are prone to nosebleeds, but the blood pressure itself doesn't cause them. So when we see an adult with a nosebleed, we have to consider the systemic cause, not just look at the event itself. Now there's a pathway of care associated with nosebleeds. First of all, it's advisable to check whether or not a patient's in shock. A loss of at least 500 mils of blood is needed to get the early signs of shock and it's rare to lose that amount during a common nosebleed. But if you ask any of my colleagues in ENT what they most hate dealing with, it's nosebleeds. This is because they tend to come in late at night, the patient's often scared, and that sets their blood pressure off, making any further diagnosis and treatment problematic. So before you can do anything, you have to allay their fears. You might even give them a sedative to try to relax them. You also need to check they're not on any medication, like aspirin or warfarin, that might affect blood clotting. The next step is to try to find the precise source of the bleeding. The simplest way to stop it is to apply a silver nitrate stick to that point. It's fairly atraumatic, but you can't get those chemical sticks to the back part of the nose, so they're mainly useful for children who tend to have fewer bleeds from that area than older people. Unfortunately, what often happens when an older patient goes into an emergency department and there may be no ENT service available, as many such departments don't have them, what often happens is that because there's so much blood pouring out, the bleeding point can't be located. In this case, a gauze pack will be put into the nose, both in front and behind the nose, to try to put pressure on the whole area and stop the bleeding that way. This can be very traumatic for the patient, and there's also a danger of secondary infection if it's left in too long. So the ideal management is to identify the bleeding point and stop the bleeding directly by cauterizing it or by ligation of the vessel. And this primary treatment will work 94% of cases. So before I go on to...
Now turn over and look at extract 2, questions 37 to 42. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. You hear a specialist in medical ethics called Anna Capstan giving a presentation on the issue of burnout in the medical profession. Hi, I'm Anna Capstan from the Division of Medical Ethics at University College. Today I want to discuss the quite urgent topic of burnout among medical professionals as it's becoming. It's kind of an epidemic, but I really think that we're not talking about this enough. That's why we're here today, to get a bit of information out there and start a conversation. So what is it? Well, burnout is a psychological and behavioral syndrome. Emotional exhaustion is one quite common hallmark of burnout. It's been defined as long-term, unresolvable job stress, a sense of being overwhelmed and depersonalized and lacking a sense of personal accomplishment. A recent study from the Mayo Clinic showed that in 2011, 45.5% of doctors reported that they felt burned out. And that number has now risen to 54.4% in 2014. More than half of all doctors in this country are saying, I really feel that some aspect of my work as a doctor is making me feel burned out. This is really trouble. It's trouble because a doctor who feels this way can commit more errors. They suffer from compassion fatigue or just not being able to empathize with others because they have their own emotional issues. They may retire early, therefore reducing the workforce. They may have problems managing their own lives. 400 doctors committed suicide last year, which is double the rate of the population average. There's trouble for patients in having a workforce that's burned out. There's trouble for doctors in terms of their own health and well-being. We don't talk about it much. We like to think that doctors can handle everything, but it's clearly not true. It's a problem and there ought to be some solutions. One type of fix is to make sure that hospitals and other healthcare environments try to create better conditions for a happy workforce and for happier doctors. This might include yoga, mindfulness training, having more therapists to talk to, encouraging people to come forward when they feel this way, peer groups and better mentoring. There are a lot of tactics that we could pursue and try to engage in. I'm not sure what's best, and maybe one size does not fit all, but it's time to really build a safety net so that we can keep our workforce functioning and we keep physicians at their careers and doing a good job, not making mistakes, not being indifferent to patients, and not harming themselves. This really is a problem, and we've got to attend to it in the workplace. It's just as important as any other aspect of workforce safety. When we institute new software, or when we have new bureaucratic regulations, 
I think somebody ought to ask, what does this do to the workforce? If one more doctor complains to me about EPIC and other types of electronic record keeping and billing forms, it'll be one doctor too many. It takes a lot of energy, makes a lot of people unhappy. A lot of the software and computer assistance that's out there doesn't seem to help the doctor. It makes more work or makes them feel frustrated. It also seems to me that if you look at what's going on with respect to regulations and administrative or bureaucratic requirements, nobody is saying, hey, is this user friendly? What's the burden that it's putting on the doctor? It's just done to save money or allow people to collect bills more reliably, but it's not asking what it's taking out of our workforce. I believe that morally, we've got to make sure that a highly trained workforce that takes a very long time to get the ability to practice medicine is a resource that we preserve and really take seriously. I don't think we're doing that as part of employee or workplace safety. I think it's crucial, but it's being ignored. We also have to view it as part of patient safety. And I think we should start spending some resources to figure out how we can make the physician workplace more user friendly. How can we make it a happier place to be? What can we do to institute regulations, guidelines, software and bureaucracy to try it out on the workforce for a while to make sure that they're satisfied and that it's not making their lives more miserable? <laughs>